This video clip is part of the EPFL introductory course on information computing and communication. It is the fifth one in a set of video clips on computer architecture. The previous video clip in this architecture series showed how transistors could be used to build computation circuits such as a 3-bit adder, for example. The present video clip will now show how the same transistors can be used to build memory and storage circuits. On a block diagram of a von Neumann computer architecture, the previous clip showed how transistors can be used to build the three computing elements. This clip will now show that they can also be used to implement the memory and storage building blocks of this architecture. Transistors could be used to build computing circuits because transistor circuits, like computable functions, can be designed to produce the right outputs given the right inputs. One might think that using transistors to record information may be trivial since the output one can read out must simply be equal to the input that was written in earlier. On the surface, this sounds like an identity function, but the challenge lies in the word earlier, which implies a recall function stable over time. Whatever circuits are used, they must be able to retain, remember over time, what was put into them earlier to be able to give it back out later. The basic building block for achieving this is shown here. As one can recognize, it connects two NOT gates in a back-to-front loop. Such a circuit has the interesting property that it admits two stable states. Indeed, if one assumes that the wire to the left of the gates happens to be powered to the logic level 1, the upper NOT gate causes the right wire to be grounded to zero. This in turn causes the lower NOT gate to maintain the left wire in its logic state of 1, which is thus stable. The circuit presenting a vertical symmetry, one can immediately see that the same stability arguments can be made if the left wire was assumed to be zero. In that case, the upper NOT gate would raise the right wire to logic 1, which the lower NOT gate would invert, thereby maintaining the left wire in its assumed grounded state of zero, which is equally stable. Thus, this is so-called bistable circuit, in other words, a circuit that remembers and holds the state that it is in over time, as long as it's not powered off, of course. It is exactly what computers require to record and remember one bit of information. Remembering the state of a bit is great. It can be read any time. However, computers also need to write into a bit of memory. So how can this be done? In order to allow a computer to write into such a memory cell, one prefixes the bistable circuit with another NOT gate and an intermediate transistor, as shown on this slide. If the computer wants to write a zero into the memory cell that currently stores a one, it posts the desired value of zero at the input of the NOT gate on the left of the circuit, which causes its output to rise to a one. Then it sends a brief logical one signal on the right wire that gates the intermediate transistor. This immediately closes this transistor thus in a sense shorting the outputs of the NOT gate on the left of the circuit and the lower NOT gate of the bistable. The input NOT gate is however designed to overpower the one of the bistable. It causes the upper NOT gate of the bistable to immediately flip from 1 to 0, at which point the lower NOT gate of the bistable also flips. The ephemeral short circuit then promptly disappears and the memory cell has flipped from 1 to 0. At that stage, the computer can remove the wire, the right signal and the input value that has now been recorded. The writing process would be identical if the computer now wanted to rewrite a 1 into the cell that for the moment remembers a 0. Using enough such circuits and transistors are cheap, one can thus build all the cells a computer needs for the register bank, the instruction pointer, and the instruction and data memory. 
The question marks left on the third slide of this clip are thus answered and can disappear, meaning we now know how to implement all the building blocks of a computer, the computing elements, as well as the memory elements. We thus have a fully implementable computer architecture. And this computer architecture boils down to an ocean of transistors. In practice, this ocean is, however, well structured into VLSI circuits, including up to billions of transistors for the most powerful computer chips of today. Such chips, plus additional memory chips, I.O. chips, keyboard, display, touchscreen, camera, loudspeaker, microphone, network, disk, and other peripheral device interfaces can all be built and assembled into computers and all forms of household appliances and industrial devices that are computer controlled. Looking back at this set of computer architecture clips, we started from abstract algorithms written in any intuitive but informal language. Although we have not talked about this explicitly, professional programmers actually write their programs in high-level programming languages that are less formal and also less intuitive but still more comfortable to write in than assembly languages. So-called compiler programs can then be used to translate high-level language programs into assembler or, in fact, directly into binary object programs. On the hardware side of things, computer engineers design computer architectures capable of understanding precisely defined assembly languages. With the help of computerized tools, other computer engineers produce detailed designs of very large-scale integrated transistor circuits. With the help of computerized tools again, Yet other computer engineers assemble these VLSI chips into complete computers and computer-controlled devices, which are then able to execute the software programs written by programmers and converted into binary code by compilers. Such computers implement the so-called von Neumann stored program computer architecture. 